to the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. God bless you. It is such an honor. Good morning, Vital Church. It's such an honor to be here today and to be speaking. And thank you, Pastor Charlie, Pastor Carla, for depositing your trust in me this morning to share the word in our, with my friends and family. Amen. So thank you very much. I just want, I want to talk to you about uh, this morning about our identity, our identity and our purpose uh, in Christ. You know, um, we're always discovering something about ourselves, right? No matter what stage we live in, you know, when we're young, we discover, you know, c certain things about our personality. And then as we're getting older and we become parents and, you know, we discover things about our children and, and how we behave in front or with our kids. And then, you know, now that I'm a grandma, I've discovered that I'm a, I'm a lot nicer. <laughs> so it gets better for you that are still, you know, a little rough in the edges. It gets better as we get older. So, so thank God that we're always discovering. But you know what? God is never finished with us. He's always uh, uh, introducing us to a, a new sphere in our life, a new, a new area that he wants to work in. And it seems like, he, it seems like we're all, he's always peeling that um, onion peel, you know, that we're always opening it up and, 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 he's, and we discover something new about ourselves and about our purpose and about our identity. And I believe that we are, are created, you know, to, to have a purpose in God and, and that he, the Bible tells us in, in, in Acts that he determined the days and the times and, the, and the, even the borders of where we would live in and that the people of old, the prophets of old, were looking to us right now in 2021, what we were going to be doing during this time. You know, here we, we talk about them, but I think they were like, wow, I wish I could live in 2021. You know, we have an opportunity to shine the brightest for Christ now. We have an opportunity to, to, to grow and to expand the kingdom of God all over the world quicker than any other generation has. We have the, the capability and the technology and the media, and we have all of these resources and money flowing all over the place. And, and it's like God wants to use all of that for his honor and for his glory but he wants to use it through each and each and every one of us. Amen. So knowing your identity and defining our purpose is very important. Romans 8, 37, you know, I'm going to throw out some scriptures there. And that says that we are more than conquerors through Christ. Very well-known scripture. We're more than conquerors in Christ. Luke 10, 19, he, he has given us authority and power to overcome the enemy. That, and that nothing shall harm you. You know, uh, the Bible says in John, uh, 1 John 4, 4, that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, you know. And then it says in, in Ephesians 2, 6, and 7, you know, that God, God has seated us together with him in heavenly places. Imagine that. We are seated together jointly, the, the Amplified Bible says. It, it, you know, we're, we're right there, co-heirs, you know, we're co-sitting, uh, like, like companions in the same chair. <laughs> we're seated, seated right there with him in the same place with Christ Jesus. So uh, the, uh, Ephesians 2, 6, and 7 says that God has seated us together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that he did that so that he might show his limitless riches of his free grace. God wants to show us something. God wants to sit us down with him to show us something. He wants to show us his unlimitless, his limitless grace, and, 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 and it's free for us because he loves us so much. Romans 8, 17 tells us that we are heirs with God and joint heirs with Christ. We're heirs with God and joint heirs with Christ. If you don't have a rich aunt or a rich uncle, you, you're still going to get an inheritance. Amen. Thank the Lord. You know, he wrote, we're, we're, he wrote us in in his testament, in his will. Amen. He's, we are going to be heirs with him. We are heirs with him. Ephesians 6, 11 through 18 talks about that he has equipped us with his armor. And, you know, he gave us the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. He gave us the belt of truth, the, shoe, the shoes of the gospel of the peace. And, you know, he basically is dressing us up. He's given us the sword of the spirit and, 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 and the shield of faith in which we can quench all of the fiery darts of the enemy. 
You know, so he's given, he's, he's dressed us, he's seated us, he's placed us, he's put us, he's in us, he wants to work through us. So he's done a lot for us. Would you agree? Yes. But there's a purpose for it. Amen. He wants, he wants something in return. Amen. He's equipping us for something big. He is equipping us for something that's coming. You know, we, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but thank God we know who holds our tomorrows. Amen? Thank God that we can rest assured and be in peace that no matter what happens next year, I mean, they're saying that now in November, and then they say that next year, something worse, and the shortages, and here and that, we can hear all of this stuff. But thank God we know the Prince of Peace. We can be at rest we could know that he is with us and that he will not leave us and will not forsake us. And no matter what comes our way, you know, he, we are ready for it. We are prepared. You know, your grandma couldn't live at this time right now. Your grandfather couldn't live in this, in this day and era. They would get lost with the, with the media stuff. They wouldn't know how to work that Facebook or that Instagram. But you do. We do. We're equipped for this time. We're equipped for what God is preparing. And he's preparing us for something big. You know, I think we all know it. We all sense it. We all feel it. He's doing things corporately. He's also doing things individually in each and every one of us. And he's doing something in the church, as a church also. I am so glad that we, we're part of this church here in the valley. We prayed for a church like this for many, many years to, to, to be here in McAllen, you know, and God answered prayers, and God is answering even more prayers because more people will be coming to the church. And I believe that the best days of the church are, are still ahead of us. Amen? That we're going from glory to glory. We're going from victory to victory. We're going from triumph to triumph. <clears throat> we will not stay defeated. We will not be defeated. The church is triumphant. Amen? So what does all this mean? I sure hope my bottle is open. Nope. Let me open it. Excuse me. What does all this mean? Why did God prepare us <clears throat> for all of this? What did God do? The, what did he do all of this for? Wherefore, we are fully dressed for battle. We are fully dressed for what? Battle. We are fully dressed for battle, for warfare. You know, and we used to think that spiritual warfare was, uh, was uh, <clears throat> that it was just to take authority over the devil and that we're fighting the devil. You know, but spiritual warfare is actually, you know, that, that, to take authority over the devil is actually the consequence of spiritual warfare. That's something that's going to happen when you get into spiritual warfare. You will take authority over the enemy. You are stronger than the enemy. We just read, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Do you believe it? Amen. So when the enemy comes against you, He's already lost. Amen? You're, you're already, he already, God already proclaimed you as the winner. So you got to go in, in the battle knowing that you're, you're, you're fighting from victory, not to victory. Amen? So that, that's just the consequence of warfare, that we take authority over the devil. But spiritual warfare is about discovering the sovereignty and the supremacy and the majesty of Jesus. To know that God is sovereign, that he is the supreme being, and, that, and his majesty. His majesty is just his authority. That, that he rules, that he reigns, that nothing will, will ever defeat, uh, defeat him. That, that nothing is going to change his plan and his purpose in, in your life. And what he has said, he, he, will, he will fulfill. So, we grow strong by overcoming I could quote you scriptures and you can quote scriptures and, 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 and hear them all day long. But to build that muscle of overcoming, of being more than a conqueror, you have to be in the battle. <laughs> you got to practice that muscle. You, know, you, you got to be in the battle. You got to be in the fight. You know, so we grow, by, we grow strong by overcoming. If we don't have something to overcome, we will never grow in the strength of that God wants us to be. If we never have anything to overcome, we, you know, uh, we, we're, ne we're never going to be in the place that God wants us to have where the, where the enemy has no place in our lives. You know, God wants you to know that the enemy has no place in your life. That he wants to fill every single spot, every single place in your life. He wants to fill it. 
He doesn't want you to give. He says give no place to the devil. Amen? Don't give him a foothold, the Bible says. God wants for you to have, for the devil to have absolutely no place in your life. Not in your life, not in your marriage, not in your family, not in your home, not in your job, not in your business. Absolutely none. God's preparing us for that. Can you imagine the victory, that, how that looks? To be more than a conqueror like we just read? How does it actually see? What is, how, how could I identify with being more than a conqueror? Because let's be truthful, we've all been defeated. We've all felt the agony of defeat. We've all felt the stench of, of being rejected. We've all felt that, you, you know, we are not liked. How would it feel to never be defeated? To know that with God, all things are possible. Amen? Amen? Well, the enemy was created to serve the purposes of God. You know, nothing has changed. There was a war in heaven, and he fell out of heaven, and he got kicked down. He got put here on earth. But he was created for the purposes of God. You know, uh, Romans 9, 17 says that God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power in you to spread my fame throughout the earth. <laughs> can you imagine? It's the only reason the devil is here. So God can show his power through you. So when the enemy comes against you, you're going to say, ha ha devil. I'm going to show you who God is in me. Amen. Because you're partnering with God. You know, without Pharaoh, we would have never have known about the ten plagues. Without Pharaoh, we would have never known that Moses could have parted the Red Sea. You know, without Pharaoh, we would have never known that the children of God were, were in Egypt as slaves and were being mistreated. Without Pharaoh, you know, we, we would have never known, you know, the one true God. The, the other nations would have never feared God and would have never known about the fame of God. That enemy, Pharaoh, the enemy of the children of Israel, were, was used to demonstrate God's power, to show off his power and his authority. So what, do, what must we do to grow in our identity? Your identity in Jesus grows stronger by overcoming. Your identity in Jesus grows stronger by overcoming. Some of you have a small ID card. Because <laughs> you, you haven't had too many battles. Some of us have a bigger ID card, and some of us have a whole big old <laughs> ID card. Your identity grows stronger by your overcoming. So every time you're faced with a battle, every time you're faced with a, with a problem, you can say, you know what? I'm going to show my identity. I'm going to show him who I belong to. <laughs> I'm going to show him what I got through him. Amen. You know, and, and I know we all know the story of David and Goliath. It's a very well-known story. But I want us to see it in, 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 in the light of his identity. You know, David, when David got the prophecy from Samuel that he was going to be king, he was about 17 years old, is what theologians say, that he was about 17 years old, 16, 18, something around there, you know. And, and, and the, the Samuel comes over to Jesse's house and says, bring me out your sons. I'm going to anoint them. And Jesse, you know, shows his firstborn, of course, very proud of that, of him. And then the second one and then the third one. and the fourth. I mean, he went down the line till the eighth one, you know, when David came. And Samuel anoints David. And David says, you know, was like, wow, I'm going to be king. I think he was as shocked as his dad. <laughs> Jesse was shocked, shocked too. Like, and you know what? And I think Jesse said, you know what, David? Go back, to your, go back up that hill and go take care of the sheep. Whatever this prophet says, heaven knows cuando se va a cumplir. You know, we don't know when that's going to take place. You, you have a job to do, son. You keep going up there. But how many of you know that the prophecy that Samuel gave David stuck in David's mind? I believe he started thinking, wow, I'm going to be king. What does that mean for me? Can you imagine? He was not the same, it was not the same, you know, the same David. He goes, what does that mean to be king? He's thinking about it, and what will he do 
what will this do to his life now that he's going to be king? What privileges is he going to enjoy? You know, what, where is he going to live? How do, what does it feel like to live in a palace? Can you imagine a 17-year-old kid thinking all of these things as he's taking care of the sheep? Yeah, he's thinking all this, and, and, and he's wondering, you know, what would it be like to live in a palace? And, 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 and he's thinking a whole bunch of things, you know. He's, he, that word, I think, really impacted in his life. Just like a prophetic word in your life that God has given you. There are specific words that God gives us in specific times to mark us, to change us, to upgrade us to his identity to how he sees us. Jesse saw David as a poor little shepherd boy, as a, as a nobody, and so did all of his other brothers. They, some even say that he was probably a, a bastard child of, of Jesse, we don't know, but that he was from another, from a concubine or from somebody else. You know, they, he didn't even want to mention that he had another one, and the prophet kept saying, come on, there's got to be somebody else because, you know, the oil's not flowing here. <laughs> So finally, when, when David comes, you know, he anoints him, and, and, and that word impacted him so much. A prophetic word can change your destiny forever. So when he goes, you know, um, when David got that, that prophecy that he was going to be king, and, and, and his dad tells him to go back up there, and, 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 and he's feeding the sheep, and then, you know, one day his dad says, hey, the boys are hungry and you need to go give them some food and they're out in the battlefield over there with the Philistines and, you know, they're, go take them some sandwiches because, you know, there's somebody that's intimidating them, really, you know. So, so when, when he goes and delivers the food in the battlefield against the Philistines and he sees Goliath giving this challenge and, and nobody, nobody, none of the Israelites are responding to this challenge of Goliath. And he's, t and he's asking, you know, Oh, my God. He, you know, I think David is thinking, oh, my God, what do you mean? He want, you know, he's going to, he, he can't take over us because I haven't been king yet. He, he's going to get over. My, you know. He goes, nobody's responding. And he's like, oh, man, I, I'm going to lose a kingdom even before I even get a hold of it. So David is thinking, wait a minute, something is not right here. Do I believe him or do I believe the prophetic word? David has to think what is more real. I mean, and what, real, what looks real is the circumstance. What looks real is that giant. What looks real is that everybody is afraid and, and, and everybody is hiding and everybody is, nobody is confronting this giant. And David's thinking of his prophecy, of his identity. He needs to step into his identity. He says, my goodness, you know, he, this guy's going to take my kingdom even before I get a hold of it. And he says, and, and, and nobody does anything. So this is when David steps in to his identity. I believe the word of, of pro, the prophetic word resonated in his ears and he heard it and he said, you are going to be king. And I bet he looked at Goliath and said, oh my God, it sure is sad for, to, to be you today because I'm not king yet. <laughs> you know, he must have looked at poor Goliath and said, oh, I'm sorry, buddy, you're, you're, you're a goner because I got a prophetic word. I don't know what you got. You got the statue and you got the, 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 the position and maybe you got the, the money, maybe you got the resources, but I got the word. I got the word of God. I got a prophetic word. I'm going to hold on to that word, David says. That word is mine. I am going to be king. Whether anybody believed him or not, he believed it. He believed it. And that's when you step into the identity, when you believe the word that is spoken over you. And when nobody does anything, he steps into his identity. It's his identity. David becomes king because he got a prophetic word from Samuel and he proved it against Goliath. He proved the word. Amen? Because there's a lot of prophetic words being thrown out there, but you got to prove the prophetic word. Amen? You got to stand up for the challenge when it's your time. Just like David and not go back. You know, so Goliath is speaking intimidation. Goliath is saying, I'm going to kill all of you guys. I'm going to, you know, feed your head and your body and everything to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And, you know, so he's, Goliath is speaking intimidation, just like the devil does. He's like a roaring lion. 
seeking whom he may devour, but he can't devour us because we're hidden under the rock. Amen? The rock, that's Jesus. So number two is, you know, first, the first one is um, think to figure out, our, to discover our identity was that your identity grows stronger when you're overcoming. And the second thing when we discover our, our identity is that our language is important in the spirit. To discover our identity, we have to speak the same language as God speaks. We have to, our words have to coincide. They have to go alongside. They have to align with the word of God. The words that come out of our mouth and the words that come out of his mouth, that is a two-edged sword against the enemy. Amen? So language is important in the spirit to discover your identity. If you don't know who you are, somebody else's language will intimidate you. When you don't know who you are, they'll tell you all kinds of things and you'll believe it if you, if you don't know who you are. And that will intimidate you. But when you know who you are, you're in, your intimacy with God, it, it, with, with, your intimacy with your identity in God and your language together, that's the thing that becomes the most intimidating for others. Your, your inti intimacy with God and your identity in God is what becomes intimidating for the enemy. Once you discover who you are, what you have, who you become in him, that becomes intimidating to the devil. Goliath says to David, I'm going to feed your body to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David says, oh yeah, is that right? He says, I'm going to get you 500 times. I'm going to do that to you and to your, I'm going to do that to your body and, and all of your friends. You know, he could talk too. You know, David could say it too. You know, throw it back at him. So David runs towards him, and David runs towards him because David knows, the th knows one thing that Goliath does not know. David has a, prof a prophecy from, from Samuel that he is going to be king one day, and he says, I'm not king today, so that means I cannot die today. He knows that he knows that he knows. He is seated. He is grounded. He identifies with the word, and he says, I am going to be king. And I'm not king yet, so I cannot die. And that's a word for many of you. No matter what happens, if you have not fulfilled your identity in Christ, you will not die. Get it. Get that word. Claim it. Proclaim it. And say, I am not going to die. I don't care how many pandemics come. Amen? I am covered in the blood of Jesus. So he runs to Goliath, and, 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 he, and he likes running through. He knows that it's like running through, through an open door because Goliath is his open door to destiny, to his destiny, to, to where he wants to go. That problem, that situation, that, that circumstance in your life, that just may be the thing that is an open door for you to reach your destiny in God. He knows that Goliath is a doorway to a higher and better place. He knew that nothing could prevent him from inheriting, from inheriting because he had a word from God. He had a word from the Lord. And the prophecies, that's when prophecy becomes so useful. You know, a word from God can sustain you. A word from God can hold your marriage. A word from God could heal you. When you get a word from God about your situation and then you say, you know, a word from God will, will supply your needs. When we get that word from God in our spirit and in our soul and we anchor ourselves in, in the word of God, that, that pulls us through in difficult times. So many times I, I've heard the word of God, in, you know, of, of prophecies that have been given before. And I say, I am not done yet. I'm not done yet. You're not done yet. God has more to give us, more to do with us, through us and with us. Amen. He knew that there was nothing that could prevent him from inheriting that, that because he had a word from the Lord. You know, and, and that's when prophecy becomes useful. And that's where you quote your identity. You quote it. You say, this is who I am. I gave you a whole bunch of identity scriptures in the beginning. You're more than a conqueror. You're seated with Christ. You know? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You know? So you quote your identity to your problem or to, that, or to, your, to your present, to your situation. So how do we begin the process of learning what our identity is? Okay, there's three, three small steps I'm going to give you. The first thing is 
you have to see yourself differently. Number one, you have to see yourself differently. You can't see yourself based on your past. You're in the present, but you can't go back and say, well, this is how I was. This is how I've been. This is how my grandma was and my mom was. No, you got to see yourself present, future. God is a present, future God, not a present, past God. He wants to bring you from now to your future. God always looks at his future. God didn't see David and say, oh, well, you're still just a little shepherd boy. No, he saw his future. Amen. When he saw Queen Esther, you know, she was a little peasant girl. And, and, but he, when he said, you will be queen, you know, she, she, he was seeing his, her, her future. When he saw Abraham, you know, he, he saw Abraham, you know, as a father of many nations. He wasn't looking at his past. He wasn't looking at his body. He wasn't looking at his situation. He was looking at him from this day forward, from the word forward. This is present future. From today forward, let it mark a difference in your life. How do you see yourself? How do you see yourself today in 2021? How are you going to see yourself in 2022? Present, future. Forget the past. Number two, you got to think about yourself differently. First, you got to see yourself differently, and then you got to think about yourself differently. You know, you don't think David had to think about himself differently up in those hills? <laughs> he had to, you know, imagine, use his imagination. You have to use your imagination. Amen. And then number three, you got to talk about yourself differently. You got to talk about yourself differently. I am blessed. I am prosperous. I can do all things through Christ. Amen. That's talking differently. That's aligning yourself with the word of God. So confess and declare your true identity in Christ Jesus. The first obstacle that we have to conquer is our own negativity. And because when a word is given to you, and I know I'm teaching you this morning, when a word is given to you, negativity rises up and clashes against that word. That negativity is going to say, oh, yeah, all right. Si, sí, como no. <laughs> you really believe it. Look at you. And negativity comes, rises up. But God designed it that way because he's there to show you this is what we're going to fight against. Amen. This is what we're going to overcome together. I'm with you now. We're going to overcome this negativity. Amen. So confess and declare your true identity in Christ Jesus. So the first obstacle that we have to conquer is our own negativity. And your identity is designed to upgrade you in the spirit. And to do that, it must target who you are not to begin the process of redevelopment. You got to know who you are not. You are not a failure. Amen. I declare over myself, I am not a divorced woman. I declare it. I am blessed. I will prosper. I am prospering. I have prospered. You know, I am healthy. You know, my children are, are um, um, part of the kingdom of God, serving in, 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 in the ministry and in the kingdom of God. You know, I declare things, and I declare what, what I am and what I am not. And that's what prophecy does. That's what the, that's the word. That's what you have to, you have to prophesy sometimes over yourself. Amen? So your identity is designed to upgrade you in your spirit. Here's one of the principles of life in the spirit. You cannot become a new person by changing your behavior. You cannot become a new person by changing your behavior. You know, um, I heard a, a preacher say that he met a man, that the guy was 42 years old, and he says, okay, well, if you're going to get to know me, I, I might as well warn you, i got to tell you something about myself. He, and he said, well, what are you, you going to say? He goes, well, I'm really, I really have a bad temper. And the guy says, oh, really? How long have you had a bad temper? He goes, well, all my life. He goes, and you're 42 years old? He goes, yeah. And when did you accept Christ? He goes, when I was 21. So for 21 years, you've had a bad temper, a bad temper, and the, and the other 21 years, you haven't found your identity in Christ. Because God is not dealing with your bad temper. He killed it. That's part of the old man. That's part of the, the sin nature. The anxiety, the stress, the fear, the bad temper, the being anxious, that's part of the old nature. And God's not dealing with 
anger management. He's not taking classes, you know. They had a meeting up in heaven, and God, not even the Father, not even the Son, and man was the Holy Spirit. He says, I don't want that job. I don't want to work with their bad tempers, with their bad, let's just, let's get rid of it. And they said, well, how are we going to get rid of it? You know, and I think there was a meeting up in heaven. I think all three of them got up there and, and said, well, um, how are we going to deal with uh, the people that, that have bad tempers or the people that, you know, that, that refuse us? You know, we're, God is going to make a planet. He says, let's make a planet. Let's fill it up with people. Let's fill it up with people that have our image, that, that, that look like us, that talk like us, that walk like us, and, you know, that they can communicate with us. And they say, oh, yeah, great, great idea. But then they said, but what are we going to do with the people that don't like us? What about with the people that are going to refuse us? What are we going to do with them? How are we going to bless those people? You know, and I think they had to take a little lunch break. And probably after lunch, they reconvened at the meeting. And they said, I got it. The Holy Spirit said, we'll just kill them at the cross. And I think Jesus was the one that said, I'll be slain before the foundation of the world. I'll die for them before. I'll give them a way out. I'll give them an escape. I'll give them a way towards victory. I'll do it. And they all high-fived each other and said, well, that's a great plan. <laughs> that's awesome. You know, so he's not dealing with your old man because he doesn't like to talk to dead bodies. That guy is dead. So he's not in the anger management course. because He doesn't have an anger management course because, you know, your behavior, God is not dealing with your behavior. God is dealing with what is missing of your new man. What is missing from your new man? If you have an anger problem, you don't have an anger problem. You don't have an anger problem if you're with Christ. You have a lack of peace problem. If you're afraid, you don't have a fear problem because... You have to grow in the knowledge of the love of God because the perfect love of God casts out all fear. So that's the new man. So God is looking at what is missing from the new man to give to your identity. Amen? That's what he wants to do. He wants to fill you with his identity, not with what you've been dealing with in the past, not with your anger, not with your anxiety, not with your frustrations, not with your defeats, not with your failures. He killed all that guy. He, that guy is dead. And you tell that guy, stay dead. Amen. He's been crucified at the cross. Amen. He dealt with that already. Amen. And he made us what? More than what? Amen. He made us more than conquerors. So that guy is dead. He says, okay, so now we are living into our new, going into our new identity. We're talking differently, we're thinking differently, and we're seeing ourselves differently. So you're discovering the person who you already are in Christ. And now, once you discover the who you are in Christ, now you can behave according to that person. You know, if, if um, we were in England and we had kings here in America and the king and the queen and, you know, the children, they all have a certain protocol. They have to walk a certain way and talk a certain way and, you know, they have to dress a certain way. Why? Because they know who they are and they act accordingly. You have to know who you are. If you're not acting accordingly to God, it's because you're not really knowing who, what your identity is. You haven't identified yourself as a true child of God. Amen. So listen, all your old behavior is already dead. God's not working on it. Why would he work on something that he killed? He doesn't like to talk to dead people. <laughs> Romans 6, 11 says, consider yourselves what? Consider yourselves dead to the power of sin and what? And alive to God through Christ, Jesus Christ. Amen? Consider yourself dead. That angry man, he's dead. That anxious woman, she's dead. That fearful girl, she's gone. Amen? And we're conquering. Consider yourselves dead, says here. Consider yourselves dead to sin. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive with me. He is really excited about telling you who you are really in Jesus. That's fun for the Holy Spirit, not dealing with your bad behavior. He wants you to discover, he wants to help you discover who you are in Christ Jesus, the new man. He wants you to know stuff about, about yourself. 
You know, he, that is why he gives you scriptures because he wants, he wants you to know that this is how he sees you and that this is what he is making you into. Amen. Here's the thing, though. When God speaks those scriptures into your life, they will clash with your inherent negativity. That is deliberate. I mean, it, it happens automatically. God, God designed it that way. God designed it that way. All prophecy to hit in, uh, on that negativity head on. So when negativity rises up inside you, you do not give it any space. You do not give it any attention because it has already been dealt with. You focus on what God is doing in you. You can't focus, uh, um, you focus on, on your identity because your identity is the key to your transformation. Your identity is what? Key to your transformation. Your identity is key for your transformation. You want to transform, you want to change? You tell, Lord, change me, change me, change me. God's not listening to that prayer. I'm sorry to say that's a functional prayer. God wants to come alongside you and show you the changed person that you are. Amen. He wants to come alongside you and work with the new man inside you, develop the peace, the love, the joy, the fruit of the Spirit. That's the character he wants to develop in each and every one of us in, in, this, in this new era in, 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 our, in our lives. So when, negati when negativity rises up inside of you, you do not give it any space. You do not give it an atten any attention because he's already dealt with it. So you focus all of your attention <clears throat> uh, on your identity because that identity is the key to your transformation. Your identity is the key to your behavior. Your identity is key to your behavior. When you know who you are, you will behave accordingly. Amen. Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. Let's look at that script, those scriptures. I'm going to read it. That, but that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is what? Corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, it says, let the spirit renew your thoughts and what? And attitudes and put on the new nature created to be like God. Not like dad, not like mom, as he saw any model. Uh-uh. But we are to be, the, the new man, the new nature was created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. You know, and, he, and we got to put it on. We got to put on this new nature. We put it on. You know, all of you, we all got dressed this morning. We didn't go into our closets and, our, and the clothes didn't jump on us, right? We had to pull it out. We had to choose. And we chose the clothes according to what we were going, where we were going, Right? We didn't come in gym shorts today. Well, at least some of us didn't, right? <laughs> Maybe some did, and that's okay. You're here, good. <laughs> but you know, you dress accordingly to where you're going, right? So you put on the new man according to where you're going, and we're going towards heaven. We got to put on heavenly clothes, amen? Beautiful clothes, amen? Peaceful clothes, amen? Yes. God wants us, you know, looking just like him, talking just like him, thinking just like him. That's why he dressed us. He talked about the armor of God. So what does that mean? It means that you resolutely do not deal with anything negative. You know, we are going, we're going, we are going um, to, and, and, and we're, gonna, we're going to put it where it belongs. And, and where does it belong? It belongs in the cross. All negativity belongs in the grave. Jesus crucified it. Amen. When you make your own way, when you make your own negativity... I'm sorry, when you make war with your negativity, with your own negativity, you are actually making war uh, using the favor of God. God has favor for you. You can fight the negativity. Amen. You can defeat the enemy. And, and favor is just an accelerated, um, it, it's, an, it's an accelerated grace that God gives you to be able to do it quicker. As fast as you, as you can become this new man, as soon as you identify with it, and you can say, Lord, give me the favor to walk into, into that. Amen? You, you know, there was a Gideon, it, he was actually so negative, 
And, and he w- when, when God talked to Gideon, and I, I love the story there in, in Judges 6, 12, God is, God is telling him, hey, you mighty man of valor. And, and Gideon is like, who in the heck are you talking to? <laughs> you know, Gideon had a very low, low self-esteem, very low mentality of who he was, identity, nothing. You know, he was, he was hiding, you know, he, he was in a bad situation. The Midianites would come and destroy all of their crops. So he was just trying to survive, you know. And when he hears those words, you mighty man of valor, he's like, oh my goodness. You know, he starts, he starts saying, not me, you know. And the Lord, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And he says, oh, sir, if the Lord is with me, he's telling him, why is all this bad thing happening to us? And many of you have asked that question, just like Gideon. If God, you're with me, why is this happening to us? Why am I going through this? Why is this happening? And on verse, uh, Judges 6, 14, he says, go in this your might. You know, the, the angel ignores what he, what the question that Gideon asks. And, and, and he's not listening to the negativity. The, the, the Lord is not listening to any of that negativity talk, that, that whining, that complaining. That's a worship language of hell. So he's not listening to it. And Gideon is still complaining and, and, and saying, well, how can I deliver Israel? I'm a poor man. You know, the, the angel of the Lord tells him, go in your mind. And go, How am I going to deliver Israel? I'm very poor. I don't have any money to do this. And, and, and the Lord just ignores him and says, surely I will be with you. And you shall smite the Midianites as one man. And finally, I think finally he gets it. God, this angel is, is, is not looking at who I am not. He is telling me who I am. God never tells you who you are not. God tells you who you are. He tells you who you are in him. You are the beloved. Amen. You are his. You are his anointed. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, you know, you are a king and a priest. God tells you who you are in Christ. He doesn't tell you who you are not. So the angel was just telling Gideon, that you, you're a mighty man of valor. You're going to defeat them with like one man. And the guy is going all crazy, saying all kinds of negative stuff. And the, and, and the Lord is not even having that. And he says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to ignore you even said it, Gideon. So when he finally gets it, God is telling, oh, God is telling me who I am. And he's not, he's not telling me who I am not. So the favor... Um, is what we are, what we are learning in, in to war against the, our negativity. So he, he tells the, the Lord, well, if I, have found, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let's do this. So when you look at what the Lord said to Gideon, you can see three things. First, you can see that the Lord gave Gideon elevated status. He thought he was a poor man, and he says, no, you're a mighty man. He gave legal authority to him with my might, the Lord told him. You're going to go with my might. So he gave him legal authority. And number three, he gave Gideon permission to overcome. Amen. He gave him permission to overcome. So what do, I do, what do you want? Uh, so what I do not want here is I do not want anyone leaving this place being, disobe- being disobedient about what God is telling you, who you are. I don't want anybody here to, to not know who you are and to say, no, well, God says I'm this, but I'm not that. That's called disobedience. Disobedience occur- occurs when we act out of alignment with our true identity. You must act in alignment with your identity. Otherwise, when God says that this is who you are and you act out of that alignment with it, then you're disconnecting and that's disobedience. So you're in disobedience and we don't want that. We want everybody to align because we need, we need this church to align to God's purposes and to God's identity to fulfill what God has called us to do. Amen. Amen. You know, Moses had a, ter- a, a similar internal battle when God called him to deliver Israel from bondage and, and from the most despotic ruler and oppressive regimen in, in, in the world. In Exodus 3 and 4, we hear a dialogue going on between the Lord and Moses. And Moses said, 
Who am I that I should go? He's doubting. You know, God is calling him. You go, Moses. You're going to deliver them. I'm going to, you're going to be the deliverer. You're going to be the redeemer of all my people. And, and God has all these exciting plans for Moses. And Moses is like, who am I that I should go? Kind of like Gideon said the same thing. And, and the Lord tells him the same thing. He says, and, and God says, certainly I will be with you. You know, God is confident in himself that if he goes with you, you're going to win. <laughs> you're going to make it. I, and he looks at you and say, yes, you're going to make it because I'm with you. You invited me into your life. Remember that day? <laughs> Remember you, you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? So he's already in partnership with you. He just wants to be, you know, exposed in you. So he's saying, Moses is saying, who am I that I should go? And all God is saying is, certainly I will be with you. He told, he told Gideon the same thing. And Moses said, well, if, what if they don't believe me? Another excuse. He's talking again from negativity. I tell you, when you get a prophetic word, negativity rises up like that. And what if it can't happen? What, if, what me, a pastor? No way. Me, a missionary? Uh-uh. Me, the owner of the business? I don't think so. I can't know. I don't even know how, to, how this business operates. And we start thinking of all negative stuff. It rises up. Well, I will give you these three signs and, and, and they will, and they will uh, he says, I will, I will give you, he says, well, I will give you these three signs and, and they will believe you. He says, you know, and Moses again keeps saying, but I'm not eloquent of speech. I can't talk right. I don't even know how to present myself to Pharaoh. Now, I want you to imagine the predicament that Moses was in when God is telling him to go talk to Pharaoh. To go talk to Pharaoh, to go into Pharaoh's palace, you know, I mean, there's probably like a thousand people in front of Moses to go in there. And I can, believe, I can imagine Moses probably in the wilderness practicing how he's going to talk to to. To Pharaoh, and he can't go with a whiny voice saying, Oh, please, please, please let my people go. You know, I believe that Moses had a practice, Pastor, that, that strong voice, Pharaoh, let my people go. I think he practiced that a couple of times. I bet he looked in front of the mirror to say that, you know. He was practicing who he was, who he was becoming. And many of us don't want to practice because we say we're pretending. I can't fake it. We pretend. But you know what? Let me give you some news. Doctors practice. Amen? And they charge you for it. Lawyers practice. And they charge you even more. <laughs> Of course you can practice who you are, saying who you are, believing it, proclaiming it, declaring it, confessing it, practice it. Don't pretend, practice. Practice who you are, who we are as, as, as children of God. God wants us to teach us that. God will, God will teach you what to say. Amen. God, and, and Moses is saying, I'm so to speak, I can't say it. I'm, what am I supposed to say? I don't know what. To, and God says, you know what? God does not listen to any of the negative word that Moses or any of his excuses at all, everything that he made. He goes, when you talk in a negative way, I don't even listen because I have come here to tell you what I want you to be in the process of what I am calling you to do. I have come here to tell you who you are so you can do what I want you to do. Amen. So the fascinating thing about identity is when, when, when something negative happens, we're learning that God does not want to be for me now. We're learning what does God want to be for me now. You know, and, and that's really one of my favorite questions. Lord, what do you want to, what do you want to be with for me now that I'm in this situation? Now that I'm here, I'm going to ask the, the uh, praise and worship team to come on up because I'm about finished here. And, and I want you to ask this question. Lord, when negative things come up, when a situation that is against you or a circumstance that you're going through, I want you to ask God, who can you be for me now that you couldn't be before I got into the situation? Who do you want to be for me? My question is, Lord, what is it that you want to be for me now that this has happened? I know that in every situation in my life and in a, and about, uh, it, that, that's what it's about. It, who he is. If the enemy shows up, God is going to increase something in me. If the enemy shows up, that's a sign that God wants to increase you. God wants to give you victory. God wants to take you to a higher place. If negative things show up, God wants you to be, God wants to be something for me. Everything with the Lord is relational. Your circumstances are never the problem. 
How you perceive your circumstances is a problem. The, your circumstances is nothing for God, but how you see yourself in the circumstances, that's what you gotta fight against. How are you seeing this problem that you're in? Are you seeing it through the eyes of God? Are you seeing it victorious through victory? Are you seeing it yourself as an overcomer in this situation? That's how you need to see yourself because that's who God made us, overcomers, amen. Circumstances are not your problem. If you really want to go, go get victory in your circumstances, you have to see them the way God sees them. You've got to see that situation how God sees that situation. So the question is, Lord, what do you want to be for me now that you could not be for me any other time? And it's all about relationship. And you know what? It's not about the stuff anymore. I think this pandemic has shown us that stuff doesn't matter. Nice things don't really matter. It's the relationships that we have with God, the relationships we have with our family, the relationships we have with one another. That's what's valuable. Amen. And it's always been about relationship. And I thank God for this pandemic because it opened up the, our eyes to see us and to see what really matters in us and what God wants to do with us and through us during this time. And because this is a time where he wants us to shine. Amen. He wants to be with you, and he wants to be something for you. Let's go ahead and sing. Amen. God wants to be with you, and he wants to do something for you. 